Welcome to our bonus episode of Processing Severance, an after show podcast brought to you by the Hollywood Critics Association. I'm your host, Rasha Goel, joined by Jeff Ewing. Uh, I'm Jeff. I'm secretly an Egan, and they didn't know it the whole time. And Rick Hong. I'm Rick, but not Rickin. So in this episode, we're going to be ranking the nine burning questions ahead of episode nine, which of course is the last episode of season one. So a lot at stake there. And we've got an exclusive interview with the one and only Patricia Arquette. This was, I mean, I'm really excited. Oh yeah. I, I, yeah. You know, well, which version get, are you going to get? Are you going to get Mrs. Selvig or are you getting Harmony Cabell? You know, I don't know. I guess you guys will have to watch and see. Can you get a really, really solid like uh, lavender tea recipe for me? God, these guys are so demanding. All right. You guys check out this interview. This show has created such a huge ripple. It's been so exciting to see um, the response of it. So I'd like to start off by asking you, what was your initial reaction when you read the script? Well, I was just given the first script initially, and I was just very confused. Uh, first of all, why they wanted me to play the part. What was the part? Where was the part going? What is this Lumen Industries? What are they doing? Wh what's everyone doing in MDR? And so I had a call with Ben Stiller, the director, and, and Dan Erickson, the writer. And every question that I had, basically, every answer led to 100 more questions. And I felt like I was already starting to go down this weird rabbit hole. Um, but I really believed in Ben and I could tell how brilliant Dan was. And I thought, you know what? I'm gonna go down this weird rabbit hole. Now mentioning Ben Stiller, you've worked with him before. So could you talk about the dynamics on this particular project? I mean, was it very structured or free flowing? Cause the script seems a little complex. Um, you know, all the shots and the alignment, everything was very balanced would be like, no, move a half an inch, no, move a half an inch that way. There's this whole hallway that's one of the sets and they would move the doors and entrances in the middle of the, the night. Wow. And so suddenly you'd be lost in this maze. You'd come to work and you'd go to rehearse and you'd be lost in a maze. And it was just very strange. It was coupled the, the world of Lumen and the way that the corporation is watching you so much and what is upper management supposed to do and behave and how and the weird rules of this company, which then all of a sudden you find you're breaking the rules and now the shifting sands of what are the rules. Um, it was kind of relentless, honestly. We're shooting with masks and there's no shots yet and we have shields on. And then I kept getting put into lockdown and I was just kind of, in this perpetual state of severance, like I'd shoot severance, then I have to go into lockdown and be all alone in a room. And then I'd get out of lockdown and go to severance and get lost in these hallways and this weird mentality way of thinking. And then I'd get locked down again. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> it was crazy making. Um, Harmony Cabell, I am so fascinated by her because she's such a mysterious woman. So in creating her, was Ben just very strict on what he wanted from her or were you able to kind of create her as you went along? He was very structured on what he wanted, the tone and emotional range of her to be. But like this strange way of talking that she has, that was kind of something I came up with. But she'd imagined what, corp not just imagined, but seen what, upper management look like and modeled herself to be this successful person and what you know a real stellar lumen employee sounds like and then I had contributed because I felt like she looked up so much to Kier in this time of Kier that she always wanted to cover her neck there was like something about modesty also and you know there was the part of Zelvig and there was the concept that Zelvig was you know, these things like that she'd mixed up the bins and um, she did have this strange dialogue. But this idea of um, like the fumbling aunt kind of and talked about dressing her a little bit like Maude and it's kind of, you know, disarms him. 
he lets her insinuate herself into his life a little bit because she's like the cuckoo aunt, the kooky lady. But in that, she's also experimenting with, wow, what does it feel like to bond with people, to make jokes? What is it like when people like you? Are you their friend? How is it to be a friend? All these kind of things that she doesn't really know. With this character, was it a little difficult for you because, or easy for you because we, she's stoic. We don't really start seeing a lot of feeling until, um, until we get towards the end of season one. It was really hard. Ben really had to, from the outside, kind of really modulate a lot. Although I have to say there was also space to improvise, but it was like also just trying to figure out the tone of the show because we were shooting all eight at uh, all, all of them at once. Um, oh. So we might shoot like episode four and two, and then one scene from nine, you know, in a day. And so it was a little bit confusing anyway, but um, we would experiment with some stuff. But he definitely had in his mind the tone and how far to go. But there were things where we went way further with certain things and then pulled back. Um, and then there were improvisations like that line that's in the trailer where Mark says, do you want me to leave the door open or shut? And I say both. That was an improvisation. And yet it's sort of like the experience of being in Lumen, like, do I close it? Do I open it? Sometimes the answer is close it, open it, both. You're always going to be wrong. No matter what you're doing, you never know really what you're supposed to be doing. We see that she has an altar set up in her house, which makes us feel like she's part of this cult maybe created by the Eakins. Can you speak about that a little to us? Well, I feel like there are religions that communicate like corporations they come up with their own language and this kind of technology about thinking and processing certain things and there's a real bleed across um, between this kind of hero worship of religion and corporation and that's kind of she um, has a very strong feeling about this corporation and it really her whole sense of self, success, everything is very much tied to this corporation and being in the good graces of this corporation. And I think with hero worship and following you know, the rules, there is a danger to lose yourself. Her heart is broken when she's let go. You know, this is the first time we're really seeing emotion from this stoic character. So what was going on in your head in creating that scene? Because we've got the drive and then we've got the destroying of the altar happening as well. Yeah, well, Harmony's whole sense of self-worth is tied to this company. And I think even though they're upset with her, I think she's doing what she's doing for the company, even though they don't understand it. They think she's going rogue. And yes, she is going rogue, but really it's... Uh, to to protect the company from itself. And so her whole identity as a person, her whole value as a human being, and her sense of pride as a professional are all getting destroyed by something that she thinks, you know, early on, there's things that happen where she's talking about PD and reintegrating and people don't listen to her and so I think she's very frustrated about not being listened to either and where is she going to go she lives in corporate housing in a corporate community she works in a corporation Um, it's really her whole identity it's collapsing You know, when she's destroying the altar, we notice that there's a Lumen branded respiration device and it's labeled with the hospital tag of Charlotte Cabell. Now, it seems like there's a date of birth on there. It could be maybe her mom's. Um, Could you tell us about that? Like, is Charlotte her source of pain, kind of like Gemma is for Mark? I don't think I can tell you much about this, Uh but that is a very interesting and pivotal 
uh, thing. Okay. For harmony, let's just say this. Uh, yeah, that relic is very much a pivotal part of Harmony's story. All right. So I'm going to look for that to kind of unravel in season two. See, we, we really dissect your, the show. I know. Part. I love it. I love it. I love I, it. Um, another thing that really stands out to me is how Miss Cabell is always talking about experimenting with Miss Casey. Mrs. Casey, poor <laughs> thing. Um, do you I feel know. like the, the poor thing is like a guinea pig for her? So do you feel like she's doing that just to test if severance transcends love, or do you think it's her personal interest for Mark? You guys are real good. <laughs> That's all I gotta say, but I'm not saying. I'm not telling you, but I, I'm gonna say you're, you're warm, you're hot, you're warm. Okay. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's something in there. Definitely. Miss Casey and Mark are her, you know, this part of her very important project. And, you know, I'll just say, you know, you can put the pieces together. You people are very good uh, at putting pieces <laughs> together. Okay. I'll tell you that. We're trying. We're trying. Um, another shot that was very, that stood out to a lot of us was when uh, she tossed and discarded that fake baby. Like she's having this beautiful moment oh, yeah. Mark's sister <laughs> about breastfeeding. And then first of all, that doll just freaked me out. It's like a chubby looking doll. And then she just throws it away. Was that, was that a choice or was that just an improv that happened for you? That was an improv and a choice because I just thought she doesn't really care. It's like she breaks character without really realizing it, you know? So she just, yeah, tosses the baby off. Like, <laughs> just, yeah. it, it was hilarious. <laughs> I was like, this yeah, is I such a key, key pivotal moment. This show was around, you know, work and life balance. Do you think somewhere along the line that ref, uh, severance references what people are really experiment, um, experiencing today, like what their value is in their workplaces? I mean, and I think in a lot of ways, we're not severed, but we do sever ourselves. I mean, there's a lot of people out there that are not integrated people. Yeah. They have one part of them. I mean, I've met several people whose dad had several families. They weren't wow. artificially integrated, but there was some disintegration that happened. So I think human beings do disintegrate in some ways. Um, but not like this, not medically and not in the same way, but hey, you got a girlfriend. You seem fine forgetting about your wife and your kids right now. And now you're with your wife and kids and you forgot all about your girlfriend. I mean, people do separate themselves. So true. Well, we're all looking forward to season two. Uh, anything you can share about season two with us at this point? No, I can't. I don't know anything. If there's going to be what's going on, if they're going to ever you know, put out some announcement. Is there going to be a two? What's happening? And nobody tells me anything, except I do want to say one thing. Yes. And it's not a spoiler or anything. Um, it was about, what was it about? Oh, just the shifting sands that I was talking about in this corporation. It's like, there used to be this um, dating thing. I can't remember what it was called, the game or something. And it's like, don't call him for four days and, or don't call her and don't tell her she's pretty. You always have to kind of knock her down and tell her you're pretty for a girl like you, you know, you're pretty for somebody who's pretty average looking or whatever. You, you were supposed to be knocking this person's ego down. You would mix compliments with, with um, a little bit offensive knockdowns, right? Yes. Sort of like, always throwing you off. That's kind of what Lumen's always doing to everyone too. They build oh, you up, they rip yeah. you down. They build you up, they rip you down. Like, um, and then when you get in that cycle, that, that weird cycle where you're always going to this well that you can never get water from, um, they keep you in that. It is definitely a cycle. I see like a little mouse running in a cage, but I'm excited to see how it's all going to unfold. I feel like there's so much that we still need to dive deeper into as the show unfolds. So I'm excited. I'm going to wrap and ask you this last question because 
I've watched your work for so many years and um, I just find you to be very incredible. And I'm sure you've oh, had your thank own learning. You. Yes. It's oh. such an honor to be here with you today. What's for one sure. thing you've learned about yourself on this journey? Because you have seen so much. What have I learned about myself? I mean, that I do really love acting. I've learned that I'm really fortunate, like blessed, won the lottery. I love, I've learned that I, I really like collaborating with other people. I love actors, other actors work. Um, and that I, I have a lot to learn still about acting and filmmaking and all of that stuff. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you. It's been such a joy speaking with you today. Thank um, you. Likewise. Um, open or closed? Both. Can I just say, I love her. This woman is so brilliantly talented. And I think whatever she brings to each one of her projects, she just leaves a memorable impression. And even talking to her, you just, you're wowed by her when you're speaking to her. And, you know, we, we talk to so many different celebrities, but there's something special about her. Uh, she definitely brings it in this, in this show for sure. Mm -hmm. Now, now the, my big burning question about the interview, were you a little bit scared? No, man. My Annie and Audi, they came together and we just rocked it. <laughs> All right, we've got the questions. This is the one that I've really been looking forward to as well. So um, I'm going to start with number nine and we're going to do a build up. Okay, so the ninth burning question, um, this is ahead of episode nine, is Irving. Why does he obsessively paint the dark pathway leading to the elevator that we see Miss Casey taking in episode eight? Clearly at some point, possibly, he's been down there. Mm -hmm. He's been down there. He's definitely walked that hallway and it's really like left something in his brain of why he just keeps doing it. Because otherwise it's like, how can you paint something that doesn't, that you've never seen? I feel like it's a part of his memory. Like maybe something was instilled there. Like something happened that was very traumatic. And that's mm -hmm. why a part of that is left with him. And I feel like they must have done whatever they do down there more than once too. Because they, they, they've shown with Miss Casey that they do it more than, they, they've done it more than once with her. They've done it repeatedly for nefarious ends. Uh, and I would be, I would not be surprised if they've done whatever sort of experiments they do down there to Irving many, many times. And like you're saying, it's kind of traumatically wrapped itself around his brain. Good insight. Good insight. Yeah. Moving on to number eight. My favorite. Baby goats. Uh, I, I'm still going with the theory that at the top of the hierarchy of Lumen, it's goats all the way down. For some reason, there's sentient goat overlords. I'm not being serious. That's not my actual theory. But wouldn't it be great if that were true? <laughs> I feel like they sacrifice goats yep. for something. We saw that weird ritual in, in perpetuity with the Waffle Party and Dylan. Mm -hmm. So it's just like, this is just probably just another component to it. And the ram head in that dance number, the cho you know, the, mm -hmm. the choreographed number. I don't know. <laughs> okay. So there's something. Oh, you're really good at that, Rick. Okay. I'm we'll we'll see if they need some uh, voiceovers for the show. I am available. Two. He's available. This episode ben, brought to you. he's available. Um, <laughs> and number seven, Melchick. Yeah. Before I say his question, you know, read out the question, I got to say, this character is so fascinating to me. He is so bizarre at so many levels. Um, and the way he is played, oh my gosh, so, so well done. Is Melchuk a true believer in what's happening or does he have his own secret agenda? And did he just forget Rickon's book um, or was that intentional? And who did he order to switch Dylan off when he was in the closet? I'm sorry. So who did he order to switch off uh, that switch when he was with Dylan in the closet. Mm -hmm. Was it one or was it two people? The only thing I know about Milchek is that his first name is Seth. <laughs> and he dances well. Yeah, and he dances well. He really well. gets he's got some, some going. Uh -huh. he's, got, he's got some moves. He's got moves. Uh, I know. I, I feel like he's running his own uh, little shindig power play because 
you know, you have all these nefarious organizations, kind of like the Sith, where to, to advance in the organization, you have to literally get rid of the, you know, cut the heads off the snake, so to speak. Uh, I feel like he's he's aiming for something bigger and and creepier. And he's definitely not severed, at least from what we can see at this point. And the that dude totally me... forgot Rickon's book. He got so distracted with oh, all the yeah. craziness that happened because like he hasn't gone back for it. No, he has not once. And even like he even said, he's like, "What is going on with you people?" But it's never dawned on him that like, "Oh crap, I left the book. this." Yeah, I was seeing mm-hmm. that's like from the outside here, definitely and maybe this is why they're going. Yeah, that's why they're going cuckoo. <laughs> he's, I mean, you know, he's he's human too. At least that from what we know. So. All right, so that's 9876. Jeff, what are we looking at? What's the question? I feel like I'm on a game show here. And number six. <laughs> For number six, we have uh, who is they and what is their agenda? So you have this mysterious resistance organization that's not the ones we've been seeing on the street that are pushing legislation and stuff. We have a they that is unsevering people, that is waging this bigger war against whatever Lumen is doing that's so nefarious. We don't quite know who they are. We don't know exactly what they're up to, how big they are, how powerful. But uh, there's definitely a major counterforce, and we don't know who they are. So do you have any theories about who they might be and what they might be up to? Well, I mean, we were introduced to you know the mystery woman like, you know, like, yes. that we think is Rackaby. We think. Yeah. yeah, so she so she clearly like, yeah, she can't do this all on her own. But she broke in on the inside to be able to mess with Petey's chip. Mm-hmm. So I feel like there's a secondary team basically that is investigating what severance is and, and mm-hmm. how these people are affected and then they kind of cracked something and now they're realizing that there's some illegal activity going on or that the, this experiment that's happening over at Lumen is destroying lives and so now this team has come in to kind of unravel this case. Yeah, because because for all we know, I mean, we we do know there's lots of of mainstream opposition in the world to Lumen and what they're doing. But we've also found out up to this point that they can do so many creepier things than we initially thought. Mm -hmm. They can trigger people in the outside world. Who knows if they planted people? They have, you know, Miss Casey, who's basically, you know, thaw when ready uh, for half an hour at a time, then put her back into storage as far as we know, which is the creepiest thing I've ever even thought of for a show like this. So she might not be real for all we know. And so the trick is I wouldn't be surprised if there's other people on the inside of Lumen that are in part of the, they, yeah. and who knows how deep that goes. Cause who knows how deep and nefarious Lumen really is at this point. True. Uh, for number five, there's some interesting things about Miss Cobell slash Miss Selvig. She's awfully invested in Mark and his life, even against the knowledge and wishes of Lumen themselves. So what the heck is up with her? Yeah, I mean it's the it's the whole like the Miss Casey aspect, you know, of of that, you know, so far that we know, like there's like you know how, how she's been watching and it's just like, dude, there's they don't recognize each other. Mm-hmm. So I think that can like obviously like that can easily like make a person start kind of kind of getting obsessed to say like when does this person crack? So mm-hmm. I have to keep watching. Meaning Mark S. Mm-hmm. When does he crack? So like she has to keep watching to see like is he ever gonna crack or not? Mm-hmm. And who is she? Like, what drove her to Lumen? We do know a little bit about her earlier life. Some some inklings from the photo in her little shrine to to Egan where uh, it, it showed her at this earlier school. So she could have been raised from a child to believe the cult-like mentality. She might be an Egan. Mentality. Yep. She might be an Egan. We or don't she know might that. be one of yeah. She, the, she might be she might be one of their little elite family friends mm-hmm. that gets put in this funnel. Uh, there's a lot we don't know Remains yet. Remains to be seen. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then fourth, and and this is my favorite. I've been, uh, y'all are probably either raptured by the question or annoyed with me for asking it every episode. But Heli, who is Heli? And is she an Egan? Because I think almost certainly she is. The last we saw of her, she was at a very exclusive party and the only Audi to be so. Uh, so... I don't know. What are y'all? What are y'all theories? I don't know. I don't. I don't know if she's necessarily an Egan. She definitely plays a very important part, though, uh, in this culture in this system. I don't know if I'm fully sold on the fact that she's an Egan yet, but I definitely she has 
some involvement with the Egan's that clearly her other colleagues do not have. I mean, the thing too is like, if you're an Egan, it's like, why would you, I, I get it. I get it maybe from like some stand, from PR standpoint, it would look like, hey, I'm willing to do it myself. But it's like, dude, why would you do that? <laughs> like my whole thing, I was like, no, I was like, don't do it. Don't do it. Why would you, don't why would experiment you purposely? on me. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's like, you're at, the, you're at the top of the chain, the top of the food chain. So why would you do that to yourself? Why would you do something at the bottom feet? No, I'm just kidding. I'm not saying bottom feet are severance themselves, but that's the only that's the only thing about it. It's like that's like it makes it like the, the strange choice. I think that's a really good point. Uh, I would say it's one of a, one of two things. One, this is this world's version of Undercover Boss, where you get severed and then you're just in it, and then you don't even know that you're the other side. It's like the evolution of that show naturally. Uh, or two, which is more likely. Uh, these Egans are true believers in this cult-like mentality, and they are creepy, single-minded weirdos. So I could absolutely see if they really believe that severing is part of this perfection of the individual. I could see one of them doing it to their crazy, weird self. We'll wait to see what happens. We got one episode left. So I mean, okay. Well, how about number three, Miss Casey? We just talked about her, and we'll talk about her some more. You know, is she a really part-time severed employee? Because you know, she said she's only been awake for like 107 hours and an eight hour day was the best day she ever had. So it's kind of crazy. So I guess that makes you kind of part time, right? Not full time. Yeah. And they've, and they've referred yes. to that in the show too. Half an hour at a time. Yeah. 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 And then, um, you know, is she in cahoots with, uh, Lumen and Cabell, which I don't necessarily think so. No, I don't either. Yeah, especially especially when you send somebody down that dark, no, I don't and, think so. And the person yeah. seems very sad and like Milchek just shuts the door on her. He's like, sorry, I've got a lot of stuff to do today. Yeah. I'm curious to see what happens with her Audi life. Um, you know, because we know that there's some connection to her and Mark. And mm -hmm. so I'm curious to see how that's going to play out for her and um, what, what that means to her. And will she even remember that? Because again, for me, this entire season, I just feel like she has been Cabell's experiment mm -hmm. so whenever you know harmony needs to do something she's always like she's her guinea pig she's sending mm -hmm. her down the hall she's sending her into some room uh, but where does she go stuff. where does she go we don't yeah. know. right and and it's just ambiguously testing so i don't think she's in on it because she's not ordering the testing for herself she's you know has this any we don't, we don't know if she has an audi or if she has a bunch of any serving different purposes but we do know that she's really not in control of being testing and she seems scared and does not like her life because the only time she's ever been happy was when she was allowed to live more than you know 30 minutes i'm hoping i'm, I'm hoping it's not an episode of westworld no i hope not either <laughs> all right number two i don't the, think so yeah number two the board so who or what are they because so far we've we've only gotten a Yes. <laughs> and that's it. I just, like, just random speaker box <laughs> that gets communicated through. And then also, you know, through uh, Natalie's headset. Except mm -hmm. episode eight, where we did hear yeah, a voice. Just, yes. No. Yes. Yeah. We heard that's, the that's yes. Like, <laughs> yeah, she's yes. like, you're not, no one's even, is anyone but, even listening? And, he, and he's like, yes. uh, yeah. But that's the first time we heard a, a voice, at least, instead of just muffled sound. So. You know, and then, like, I mean, then why did they wait for Cabell to, you know, present her findings on reintegration, you know, at the gala before firing her? So I think the board is definitely made up of Egan family members. Sure. Mm -hmm. I think that's obvious. Yes. Uh, who are they? I don't know. You know, they, but they're definitely Egan family members. Well, and I think they, they found out about some side things that she was running that were not sanctioned. And we've seen increasing chaos under her control, her quote unquote control the entire time. So I think the combination of things being increasingly out of control and then them finding about uh, Heli trying to kill herself and then finding out from some of these side activities that she's been doing, you know, that was the last straw. And then number one, number one, we've number talked one. about this is, you know, what's, you know, Lumen, you know, like what, what's up with the artwork, you know, the illustrated cards uh, depicting the interdepartmental Mm -hmm. you know, violence, you know, we've like that they've referred to. And like yep. Milchek was like, you know, he had to actually go to the extreme of the overtime contingency to figure out where that mm -hmm. card was at. And, you know, and clearly like they're playing the d departments off of each other. And we're still trying to figure out what Lumen does. 
Yeah. Like, what happens here? <laughs> I mean, right. Are they a cult? Are they a company that does experiments? I mean, like, what? what's like, you know, what, what does... What's their what product? Does, what, does, what, does, what does MDR do? You know, like, what is, what is the whole purpose of... Because, like, as we saw in episode eight, you know, like, they... they hit their quota or whatever, and then it takes you to, like, some video game finale. Right. Oh, yeah. So the, we, the weirdest, like, 8-bit NES yeah. game I have ever seen in my right? life. And, you know, and then, and then he, just, he just kind of flies off. It's like, I love you, Ellie R. Yes. It's amazing. It's magical. I want to play that game. I don't. All right. Well, those are our <laughs> nine burning questions ahead of episode nine. And, of course, we do have a bonus question, as always. Um... What does the happy ending look like for the innies and outies of each one of these characters? Um, I think that's going to be a deeper, deeper conversation. But yeah, like where is that balance? How does it aff affect each one of these characters? See, but we, what does it mean? That's the thing. It's like we need more because like we we know, like, like I've talked about with Mark, the 50-50 is there. Right. And I can see almost see the complete human being other mm -hmm. than the fact of that he started a relationship with Alexa and now he has this relationship with Heli. But we haven't seen enough yet from Irving's like outer person. Mm -hmm. We or at least Hallie. know what he does. We at or least know Hallie. what he does. Yeah, you know, definitely would not not from Heli. And same thing with um same thing with Dylan. Dylan too would to have know enough. what their happiness could be because they're so because we've only been given so much of like He now knows what is what has been missing. Right. 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 Um and so it's interesting cuz right now their current strategy seems to be well, screw our Audis. Our innies are going to become our outies, and then there are no outies. There's just us. But we've fallen, you know, equally. We we've started to care for Mark's Audi character, uh, Irving's outing, uh, Pain the Metal Man. I gotta I gotta back that hobby up. That's awesome. Hey man, uh, get, get, episode, get over get over the Ace of Spades, dude. Come on, it's and I, Ace of Spades. <laughs> That's the only reason you like him. But in episode eight, it was really interesting how Mark kind of expressed, right, like. He's curious to know um, how this is all going to impact him and, and who he is on the outside. So, yeah, I guess we're all, we're all going to watch it unfold, too. So thank you again for joining us on this bonus episode. I'm Rasha Goel, joined by... I'm still the same Egan, I mean, uh, regular Jeff that I always was. And? And, dude, I don't have an any or an Audi. I'm just me, Rick Hall. Thanks again for watching, and we'll see you at episode nine. That's one you don't want to miss.